good to see the sunshine. Yes. Amen. It's good to feel the warmer temperatures. So don't put your faith in the groundhog just yet. Uh, let us stand. We're going to turn to number 881 and say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. standing and sing oh for a thousand tongues to sing number 57 let's do all verses six and eight through ten. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from him facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men, 
and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book from the law of God with interpretation. They gave a sense that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. This morning our upper room devotional was from Jeremiah 18, 1 through 10. And it talked in that about God shapes our imperfect lives and God can use even shattering storms to do good in us just as the potter shapes the clay. This week I've been following this lady on TikTok. On TikTok she's known as Tow Truck Jess. And three years ago she was accused of involuntary manslaughter because her tow truck was parked on her street and two people on a motorcycle, I don't know if they were drinking or just speeding, went up under her tow truck while it was parked and she was accused of involuntary manslaughter for that. She lost her child because of that. Her ex-husband took the kid away from her, accused her of all kinds <clears> of stuff. <throat> so for three years she's dealt with that. Well, two, Thursday this week she had a court date and she was acquitted of the manslaughter and no char all charges were dropped against her. She took her Bible with her when she went to court and the bailiff said, well, I've never had anyone come into court with their Bible in their hand. She's a very faithful, devout Christian lady. She spreads good things on TikTok and God brought her through this terrible storm that she's dealt with for three years and she was acquitted of that manslaughter. Mm. So God can move in all storms. This morning on, for announcements, we have Sunday school each Sunday at 10 a.m., worship services at 11. If you missed the Methodist Home Offering last week, you can uh, do that today. Uh, there's still Methodist Home envelopes on the back of each pew. The total offering for last Sunday was $400. Our men's prayer breakfast is Wednesdays at 7.30 at Tudor's. Wednesday night Bible study is day 39 reading. Fellowship and food is at 5.30. Bible study is at 6. Uh, there's an insert in your bulletin with the scripture and questions that we'll be discussing. There will also be a steering committee meeting Wednesday night. Thank you for all who donated items for the January's ministry to the West Care Shelter. February activities. Next Sunday is our Valentine Fellowship Luncheon. We'll take up a special offering. There's a list going around for what you want to bring. This is our soup bean dinner. So we're going to have soup beans and all the fixings. So make sure you sign up to bring some for us to eat good next week. <laughs> Any other announcements? This morning on our prayer list, <clears throat> Carla Fields isn't with us today because she's not feeling well. Remember her in your prayers. I continue to remember Bill Murphy, all those taking cancer treatments. Kim Coleman has her fourth treatment Tuesday. That's always a rough week for her, so remember her in prayer this week. And let's remember the family of Keen Michael Johnson. Any other spoken requests this morning? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Dear Lord, today we come before you and thank you. We just take a moment to praise you. And God, we come confessing our sins to you, knowing, God, that you hear our prayer.
And God, we also bring our petitions before you from those that are on our hearts, those that were mentioned, spoken and unspoken, Lord. God, we continue to look for you for guidance as the church, Lord, many of them continue to try to figure out uh, what to do and how to do it. And Lord, we just know that uh, together with you on our side, that go, Lord, the church will be victorious. <clears throat> and so we pray, God, that you'd help us today to lift one another up, to encourage one another, but also, Lord, to challenge one another. God, we, we know that without you, we cannot do anything. We are, uh, we are the branches and you are the vine, and we need you, Lord. We pray for those that are traveling today, Lord, that couldn't be here. For those who are listening from a distance, Lord, through virtual media. And God, we pray for those uh, who may be struggling right now in the hospital. We pray for all our churches today, and we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now our uh, next lectionary reading. Um, we're we're going to change that, uh, Blake, so you can take that one down. I meant to take that off. It's a different one. Good morning. Good morning. I was thankful that God lifted me up to come to church today. Amen. Even though my body said no, my heart was overjoyed. Our first, second lectionary reading is Luke 4, 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding countries. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. As it was custom, he stood up to read. Then the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. <clears throat> he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Mm -hmm. Word for Word God's God. people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. We're going to sing our doxology in just a moment. And I want to thank you uh, for your giving to the children's home. Uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned it before, but... Uh, even with uh, this filiation in June, we're still planning on continuing that ministry because the, the children's home is not actually uh, Methodist. They are not owned by the Methodists. They are a separate entity, and they get support from the Methodists, but also other denominations. Uh, so in a, lot of, a lot of these organizations are, uh, they may be affiliated uh, with the Methodists, but they're not owned by the method. So we're going to continue that ministry. It's a, it's a wonderful ministry. And I thank you all for your giving uh, toward that. 
We'll also be taking some items to the uh, shelter today, to the West Care Shelter. I uh, want to thank everyone who donated to that. We've got a whole table full down there uh, that we're going to be taking over today uh, or tomorrow, uh, but we're going to need some help carrying some of it out later. Uh, but So thank you for your donations. You guys are always wonderful about that. So at this time, we're going to sing our doxology, and we're going to ask you to stand, and then uh, we'll ask Richie to pray. seated today and John's going to come and lead us in the song and John I don't know how familiar you are with this but uh, it is a song that goes along with perfectly with our theme today on the communion of the saints and uh, I think it's been a long time since Johnny has played this so thank you all for putting up with me <laughs> All right, we're going to sing number uh, 558. Let's do verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. You can remain seated during this one. We are the church.
good job, guys. Good job on that. Uh, that's, a, that's a fun song, and I really enjoy that. So uh, don't put it away. We may do that one again soon. You may see it come up. Uh, our text today is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 27. And we are continuing our theme on uh, the from the Apostles' Creed, We Believe, the We Believe series. And uh, we've talked about God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Catholic Church. And then the one that comes kind of after that is we believe in the communion of the saints. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now this is closely related to last week when we talked about the Holy Catholic Church because the communion of the saints is part of that. Uh, but it's kind of a, a, a little breaking down of that, I guess you could say. So let's do our reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then we'll break that down. Verse 12 says... For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one, the one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we are all made to drink of the one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. And if the foot would say, because I am not of the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not of the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior member, that there be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. It's interesting to me how sometimes the church uh, is supposed to model uh, after Jesus is basically it's kind of like the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. And, uh, and we're not supposed to mimic the world. We're supposed to be different. And if the world, if we follow the ways of the world, the way that it usually happens is if someone who has a lot of prestige, someone who has a lot of money, someone who has a lot of power, those are the people we cater to, right? There are those people who, who personally seek out those kind of people and try to hang out with those kind of people. They may even go to a church with those kind of people. And those are the people they really uh, throw them to. They, they, they respect them and they, they, they you know, give them all kinds of attention. On the other hand, the people that come into your church who may not have all that power, money, and prestige, they're kind of ignored. Well, according to the book of James, that's a sin. And that should not be the character of the church. It should just be the opposite. In fact, he says uh, we should really pay more attention sometimes to those people that are lacking than we do the ones, because the ones that, uh, the ones that are not lacking don't really need all that. They already, you know, they already get that. And so today I want to talk about the characteristics of the church. And I want to say, first of all, uh, the word saints, and we, we're talking about when we talk about the communion of the saints, and uh, we're not necessarily talking about communion, although the word means the same. And the word communion uh, just means that you know togetherness, uh, that we are uh, together and we're communing. And uh, when we have the word saints, we're talking about people that are holy, people that have been set apart. And again, don't let that word scare you. Uh, but we are called holy and set apart by God. We are called saints. And we usually think a lot of times of saints of people like uh, Mother Teresa or St. Francis or something like that. But, but when the Bible uses the word saints, it's not like that. It's all people who have been baptized 
in the name of Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are saints of God. We have that distinction. Not that we're perfect, but we are uh, we're forgiven. And because of that, we're, we are saints. And so you are a saint. I am a saint. You are the church. I am the church. And we are the church together. And we want to talk about that today. And if you have your, you should have an outline uh, handout in your bulletin that you can follow along, take notes if you like. But most, uh, I've got some of it already filled in for you. Uh, so for our first uh, point today, these are the characteristics of the church. And the first one is unity. And you find that in verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And so really what he's talking about there is, is that the church should, should symbolize unity. Even though we have people from different nationalities, different backgrounds, uh, and, and even in our church, you know, uh, we, we have people that have different socioeconomic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. Uh, but that doesn't matter. We're still the church. We're still one uh, in Christ. And so unity should be something that uh, really characterizes the church. And, and I'm referring specifically, I think the apostle is writing to a specific church here uh, in Corinth. And, and he is really addressing a local church, not the universal church, but a local church. And of course, we know the church at Corinth had its issues, right? Uh, they weren't a perfect church. They definitely had some uh, schisms that went on. They had some problems. Uh, and so Paul was trying to give them an analogy of the body and how our body, though it is one body, it has different members, you know, the hands, the feet, and it, it's not just an eyeball. It's not just a head. It, it's one body. And, uh, but yet, it's all needed. It's all needed. It's all necessary. And so unity, in, in the sense that if you think about the human body, um, you know, the uh, you, you may have seen some of those movies where they had uh, uh, I don't know, one maybe was Steve Martin where they had two people living inside his body and trying to go different directions and you know a female and a male and all this and but the truth is our bodies are designed God designed our bodies to work together so that uh, you know for example if my hand has if I hit my hand with a hammer uh, it sends a signal to my brain that ouch that hurt. And we need to do something about it. Uh, and, you know, we have a body that works together. All the body is designed to work that way. And uh, the church should be the same way. Even though we are different uh, members, we are designed to be unified and work together. It doesn't mean we always agree, but as, as uh, Wesley said, we may not all think alike, but we can all love alike. And so uh, I, I, I'm thankful that through this process of, of discernment that the church has gone through in the last uh, year or so, <clears throat> even though other churches we've seen some, uh, some splits and some things happen in these churches, our churches stay pretty, uh, pretty unified in this. And, and, you know, it doesn't mean that everyone 100% agrees with everything, but what it means is that we are a body, we are a church, and we're going through this door together. And we're going to uh, just follow the Lord, and, and, uh, and, and God will take care of us. And, and I'm thankful for that. So unity is something that should characterize the church <coughs> in the body of Christ. But the second thing is diversity. There should be diversity in the body of Christ. And verse 14 said, the body does not consist of one member, but many. And so uh, the church, as I said, we have different backgrounds, different things going on, people from different walks of life, and that's good. There should be diversity in the church today. The church should really look like the community uh, in the sense that whatever the community is made of, of different people. And if you have a church that's all wealthy people, well, that's not necessarily a good thing. If you have a church that's not all wealthy people, that's not always a good thing either because we have to pay our bills. And, and so we don't want to cater to one pit person or one type of people. Uh, we, you know, there may be churches that do that. Um, but what we want is diversity in the body of Christ. We want different people with different gifts, different backgrounds, uh, <clears throat> just like the body. And, and we come together and we work together to bring uh, this unity uh, and make one, but there's diversity. And I think... Uh, I think that's so much needed in, in our world today is uh, in, in the church is diversity. And then the next one is dignity. And that's what he says uh, 
in verses 15 to 24. We need unity and we need diversity, but we also need dignity in the church today. And what that means is everyone is treated with respect and everyone is loved and cared for. And I don't think the church has always done a good job of that. I don't think we've done a good job with some, you know, the way we treated people who are minorities. I don't think we've always done a good job with the way we've treated people who are different from us. We haven't done a good job uh, with uh, even the LGBT community. We just haven't done a good job because we haven't shown that same respect. And one of the things that it says in the, uh, in the discipline even now is that every person is of sacred worth. Can we agree on that? That every person is of sacred worth. And I don't mean that, that we all uh, you know, necessarily agree with each other on everything. But we ought to start right there. We ought to start right there and say, okay, I'm going to treat you with respect. And I, I want you to treat me with respect because I am born of God. I'm a child of God. And I, am, uh, I deserve that much respect. And so, But here's the problem. Here's the problem. You have a couple different kinds of people in the church. First of all, you have those with an inferiority complex. And that's what he says here. Uh, if the foot says, I'm not of the hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it less part of the body. And the ear says, because I'm not an eye. So what's going on here is someone says, well, I, I'm not like so-and-so. I, I can't sing like Melinda, you know. And, and, and I, can't, I can't teach like Paul. And I, I can't pray like Richie. And I can't do this. So I'm really not... God can't really use me in that church. I, I'm just going to kind of stay in the background. I'm not going to do anything because I'm really not that important. That's an inferiority complex that, that Paul was dealing with there. That some people felt like, well, because I'm not this and I'm not that, then I really don't have value in the church. And that's not true. Everyone has value in the church. And that's what he's saying. And so we have to be careful that we are not uh, having that, that complex of, of feeling uh, less than because we're not, we don't, maybe we don't preach like this person. We don't have the same gifts as this person. Or, you know, and you know what I love about the church, the way it should be in the church, um, is that we're all people who are not perfect. And that means that our worship services are not going to be perfect either, right? I mean, for example, uh, you know, I do know that there's churches who uh, every, every person in, that, uh, in the worship committee and, and on the stage, the piano, everybody is professionally paid. And, and so they want, they want to have perfect singers and perfect uh, musicians and, and all that. And, and I'm not knocking that so much, as, but I really think that the church should be made up of people like you and me, and, and, and that we should, whatever gifts we have, that, that's why, you know, sometimes we may hit a wrong note. We may play a wrong note. We may, uh, we may sing a wrong note, and, and the sermon may get a little sour sometime or whatever, because we are who we are. We are people, and if we are the kind of people that God wants us to be, we'll have grace in that, right? And we'll say, okay, if Larry messes up in the bulletin or, or somebody does this, we're going to give them grace because we mess up sometimes too. And that's what the church should be. So we shouldn't say, well, I'm not going to do that. Or I'm not going to sing because I'm not a perfect singer. I can't sing like Melinda. Or I can't sing like John or whatever. Or I'm not going to read the scriptures because I'm, I'm not. No, 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 no. That's what I love about this kind of worship. Is that we all bring our gifts and talents. But we're all different. And we are who we are. And you know, I could, I could probably preach perfect sermons if I copied somebody else's sermons maybe. Uh, but that's not what God called me to do. God called me to be me. And God called you to be you. And so don't allow those things to keep you from following God. That's an inferiority complex. And then he goes on to talk about the superiority complex. So you have those in the church that are only inferior, but they're superior. And, and that's what he says here. He says, notice, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Well, that would be ridiculous. You know, if you imagine somebody having a conversation saying, well, I don't really need that foot. I just cut it off. I don't need that hand. That would be silly. But yet there are people in the church who, because of their own uh, beliefs of their own self, and they've set themselves up so high that they don't feel like they need anybody else. That's a, a superiority complex. And they feel like, well, we don't really need that person in the church. They, they don't put in that much money, or they, they can't do this, or they can't do that. So, you know, what do we care if they come or not? That's a wrong attitude, for one thing. 
And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying that is a problem. There was a problem in the Corinthian church. It's a problem in a lot of churches. This superiority complex where we feel like, I don't need you. I don't need, I don't need this. Um, and, and, you know, we really don't need these people in our church or those people in our church. No, we need them all. We need everybody because we, we, uh, we have to understand that we need the body of Christ and all the members that are represented. So we have to be careful about that, that everyone uh, is treated the same. And so how that happens is with dignity, by, by the way. Here's the solution to that, the problems. He said that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. In other words, everybody gets treated the same. The same respect for everyone. That's the solution for an inferiority and superiority complex, is that we just treat everybody the same. It doesn't matter if somebody walks in this door and drives up the Cadillac in a three-piece suit, uh, you know, and then the next person comes behind them and they drive in in, in a beat-up old junkie car and they don't dress so nice. We should treat them the same. Now, sometimes we all have to repent for those things because we, we, we've been guilty of that, but, but that's what we should do. We should treat everybody the same. So the just dignity is just treat everybody. You know, it doesn't matter who they are, what they've done. You know, let God take care of the sins. Let God take care of the problems that they're dealing with. Well, just love them. Just love them and let God deal with it. That's called uh, dignity. Uh, and that's what we're called to do. Now, what are the results of treating people with dignity? What are the results of these characteristics when we do this in this community? Then we have a true community. That's really what he's saying there. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one is honored, all rejoice with it. You're the body of Christ. And so the idea there is that we are community. We are, we are like one in the sense that we rejoice when we need to rejoice and we, we weep when we need to weep. Uh, you know, we don't get jealous because somebody sings better than us or we don't get jealous because somebody gets a promotion and we didn't. We rejoice with them. We, we honor that. We thank, we're thankful for that. And at the same time, uh, you know, if someone's suffering and going through a tough time and they're grieving, we grieve with them. I've seen the church at work in, in doing that, and, and it's a beautiful thing to see the church of God come together when a loved one, uh, one of their members is hurting, to be there, the hands and feet of Christ for them, whether you're just bringing a dish or saying a prayer or, or just a presence. Uh, that's so important that we do that. It's so important. You know, we had a situation <clears throat> the other day with one of our chaplains uh, had a, to go down to the ER and had some really, this person, had, a really bad thing had happened and someone had died and it was a situation where uh, the chaplain was called down. And he said, I didn't know what to say. I didn't really, what, you don't really know what to say in those times, so I just kind of listened to her. And just sat there and I said, well, that's great. That's exactly what you should do. That's, that's a good chaplain work right there. Because sometimes that's what God calls us to do, is just to be a presence for people and not really say anything. And if one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Um, I remember when I was uh, going through a time in my life where I moved, I moved to Indiana. I was a young man and I was alone. Um, started working in a factory, <clears throat> moved in with my uncle for a while, and I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know anyone. I just uh, uh, had not been going to church that long, <clears throat> but uh, I, I, I was looking for a place to go. And <clears throat> I went to a few churches. Some of the, the churches, were the Baptist churches that I was used to, uh, you know, the, the denomination that I went to, didn't really feel welcomed that much and, and, and still looking. And one day I was driving down the road and <clears throat> I saw a sign on the church that said the Friends Church. And I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. I, I could use a friend. I think I, I'll try that out. And, uh, and I didn't know that it was a Quaker church. I didn't know that's what that stood for. I had no idea. Uh, I went to this church. It was a modern Quaker church. Uh, but I remember that particular Sunday uh, they have something that's a little different. They don't do communion like we do with the elements. They do a sharing of hearts. And they call it, their communion is sharing in the communion of friends. And so what they do is they just share their hearts with one another. 
And so everyone was sharing that particular Sunday, and I, I didn't know anybody, but I felt led to share too. And so I got up and I stood up and I said, you know, thank them that I was able to be there and enjoyed the service and, and just said, I'm, I'm here uh, looking for a place and, and I'm really uh, just want to find a, a place to attend and, and thank you all for being here. And, uh, and I might have said something that, you know, I was going through a tough time or whatever, I don't remember. But I remember after the service that they, people came up to me. And one particular family came up to me and invited me to go home for dinner. And I thought, wow, that's great. And I did. I went and had dinner with them. And after that, uh, I was invited. I found out I played music. And I was invited to play in the praise band. And uh, I brought my guitar in. Uh, not that they needed another guitar player, but uh, they allowed me to do that. And uh, at that time, this, this one guy that was a much better guitar player than I was, he just kind of brought me along. And, and I began to play in the praise band. They had a uh, like a third service, a contemporary service. But the point is that, you know, this church made me feel welcome. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about this church. And it wasn't important to me what the name of the door was, just the fact that I was looking for a community. Someone with, that would accept me. And, and, I, and I stayed there while I was in Indiana. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the church is supposed to be like that. You know, I heard a story about uh, Frank Sinatra, I think it was, was when he was getting older, you know, around 78, <clears throat> he was starting to lose his memory. And I love Frank Sinatra, but he has some great music. And he would, he would start to sing, and <clears throat> but he sometimes would forget a little bit. So one, one particular uh, concert he was doing in this venue, he, he started to sing the song, and right in the middle of it, he completely lost it, the words. And he just stopped. And, and for a minute, the band kept playing thinking he would pick back up and he, he just started saying I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry and finally the band quit and it was just eerily quiet and he just kept saying I'm sorry I'm sorry to the point where he, he started to drop the mic and he turned and looked and was getting ready to walk off the stage when one person in that building way up in the balcony stood up and he said, that's okay, Frank. We love you. And he started clapping. And then all of a sudden, everyone started clapping. And for about five minutes, they were just cheering and clapping. And you know, he started singing that song after that point and never missed a word. And somebody said, and, and by the way, after that, he was able to tour a couple more years before he had to quit. But somebody said that uh, that, that one man who stood up that day brought Frank back from the ashes. I think that's what the church should be doing. Instead of kicking people when they're down, we should be helping lift them up from the ashes. And I hope you can see that too, and I hope you want to do that too. I hope that's the kind of church and the kind of Christian you want to be today. The kind of church that would be the church and love everyone. Let's get ready to do our communion here in just a moment. And I've asked uh, Melinda and Johnny to, to do a song for our communion. So as we think about the church, Jesus gave this representation of what it's supposed to be like. You guys can come on up and get ready. He used a single loaf of bread. And uh, back in the day, before the pandemic, we, we usually used a single loaf of bread. But today, the church, like a loaf of bread, represents the body of Christ. He said, this is my body, broken for you. One body, one bread, one body. I want you to listen to this song, and then we'll do communion.
Beautiful. Thank you so much. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. In just a moment, we're going to partake. And you have these, hopefully. Uh, and we'll do the, the bread first so that you don't spill the juice since it's upside down. Uh, but uh, you just peel that off here in just a moment. But let's say a prayer first. Father, thank you for the love that you poured out on Calvary. Thank you for giving your body. And Lord, thank you that we are now the body of Christ. And you are the head of the church. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We ask you, God, to bless these elements. And God, help us to be the church that you called us to be. In Christ's name, amen. We invite you today to take communion with us. The body of Christ, broken for you. Go ahead and take the, the bread. The cup of Christ, given for you. Dear Lord, we thank you that, God, we can come together and commune with one another and, God, be a part of a family. And, God, thank you that we have a family that you have given us here on earth in the representation of the church. And we pray you continue to bless the church until you come in your final victory. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, we are going to uh, end with our Blessed Be the Tie That Binds song. Uh, our benediction today. Go out among the world, again, uh, among the outcasts, the grieving, and speak the words of life and hope. And may, all, may all God breathe into your life, His love, His care. And may you just follow him wherever he leads you today. We are pleased to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's sing number 557 as we stand. Let's do verses 1, 3, and 4.